You know, I'm really just excited about what God's doing. And you can say, well, in light of the election, how can you be excited? How many know God's still on the throne? And we're functioning in a kingdom that's more important than the United States of America. Now, since we, we kind of skipped last week, I've had a lot of time to pray and to contemplate. And God's been speaking. And I've already begun getting feedback from the first on the new wineskins from congregations and some messianic synagogues, not only in America but in other places. And it, it, it resonated with them. How many know that if you really hear from God, it's going to resonate with people, with those who have ears to hear? And uh, you see, I think not only do we need to have a new heart, we need to have that new wineskin. The church does too. When we look at the past election, guys, we see some interesting statistics. The platform that won was primarily a platform of iniquity. And a majority of America voted for iniquity. Because that's what they used as their platform. And in fact, if you watched when they were making their nominations, they at the very, you know, they, they just kind of threw in there, oh yeah, we believe in God, and, and Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And if you watched it, it was booed down three times. And finally, with I, I got to watch a... Uh, a guy that used to be one of the major players in the DNC says, well, what we do when we, 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 you know, it's supposed to be a voice vote and the ones that get the loudest is what you do. We turn down all their mics and so there was one guy, yay! Well, all right, it's been passed. It, it, it kind of shows you the mentality of what's going on. Remember me telling you that it, the light is going to begin separating from darkness and our choices in so many areas are going to get clearer than ever before. And uh, America has spoken. It kind of shows you where we really are. Uh, the church has lost an entire generation. And what, were the, what was the catalyst for losing that generation? Education and the media. And uh, I think it's time. There's, there's going to have to be a remnant that begins taking a lot of that back. Now, one of the things, too, and this is a, a statistic. Now, I've looked at two or three different places. The Blaze puts this at 42%. I saw another one that put it at 47%. But uh, the Blaze tends to be very accurate. Uh, they said that 42% of the vote for the current party that won came from evangelical Christians. 42% of evangelical Christians voted for a platform that was directly against the Word of God. That really kind of shows you that somebody says they're evangelical anymore. That doesn't mean very much. It, we kind of saw this coming back in the mid-90s with the school that used to be called Evangelical Theological Seminary. But I begin to find out that evangelicals aren't the evangelicals that there used to be. And so we said, you know, when I, when I saw that freight train coming and we began to pray and see God, God said, it's time to change the name. How many know that, you know, evangelical, the, the definition can move, but biblical life can't? That I want to live by this. I want to, I want to walk with this and walk in this. <sighs> Much of today's church is not really the church anymore. Have you, have you come to realize that? I mean, we, just locally, when, when you're talking with believers, we find out that they have a very shallow understanding of Scripture and have no desire to go any deeper. They prefer to live by sound bites rather than by sound doctrine. And if you go beyond that sound bite, they go blank. Did you ever talk to somebody, and all of a sudden there's nobody home? They, you, they just zone you out. You took over 30 seconds to describe what you believed. <coughs> Let me tell you something. If it takes you less than 30 seconds, you don't believe very much. And there used to be a time that sound doctrine was very, very powerful in, in the body of Christ. Now, we have been trained by the secular media that everything's reduced to sound bites. You can be deceived with sound bites. Haven't you noticed? You can actually have somebody giving the right explanation. They edit it down to a sound bite, and, he, and they can make him say the opposite of what he said. 
Sound bites are not going to do anything for us. <coughs> Today's believers are also more concerned with programs than functioning in the kingdom. It's got to change. A friend of mine, Dr. Tom Horn, reprinted a book through Defender Publishing. It was called Earth's Earliest Ages by George uh, Pember, and it was written in 1876. How many know that was a while ago? And so I saw it came out on the Kindle. I love the Kindle. It's instant delivery. And it's really dealing about the last days. And this was from an 1876 perspective. And so I get into the first chapter, and, and several things really struck me. Number one, the depth of his insights, rather than the shallow cotton candy stuff that we get off the bookshelf today. But also, here he is dealing with the last days. He's dealing with Genesis chapter 6 and all these different things. And his first chapter, all he is doing is lamenting on how that the, the pulpit is not using proper hermeneutics or exegetical process. And so we have all these crazy doctrines going around that aren't really of God. And it dawned on me that what he was dealing with is one of the symptoms of the last days. Men will not endure sound doctrine. And I want to read a quote because he, he puts it in such a way that, that I could not. He says, For if we be observant and honest, we must often ourselves feel the difficulty of approaching the sacred writings without bias, seeing that we bring with us a number of stereotyped ideas which we have received as absolute, cer absolutely certain and never think of testing but only seek to confirm. And yet could we but fearlessly and impartially investigate, we might find that some of these ideas are not in the Bible at all, while others are plainly contradicted by it. For the tract of many a popular doctrine may be followed through the long range of church history till at length we start with a fright at the discovery that we have traced them back to the very entrance of the enemy's camp. I thought I could not improve on that. There's a lot of things, guys, that we receive as, as doctrine that nobody ever examines. You know, when we begin to discover our Hebraic heritage, <coughs> Mary would often challenge me, and, and uh, I couldn't fall back on my dispensationalism. I couldn't fall back on all my theological training because I would give her the stat pad answer that I was given in seminary. And she says, well, yeah, but that doesn't make sense. How do you put it in with this scripture and with this scripture and with this scripture? My spirit's telling me, uh-uh. And I'd have to go back and I would have to examine with great honesty. Found out that the pre-tribulation rapture isn't as quite as plain as I was led to believe in scripture. We ran into a lot of things. Ran into a lot of the, the things that we celebrate and things that we do are not found in scripture. They are found in tradition. We begin changing things. And the more we change things, I found the closer we begin to get with God and the further we got away from the church. Or what is called the modern organized church. I think what God is doing is, is God is saying, listen, this is the day and the hour of the remnant. Not organized church, but the remnant and I want to go to Romans chapter 11, verses 3 through 5. And I'm hoping my voice holds out. That's one of the reasons I didn't help with praise and worship this morning. I wanted to have enough strength left to my voice to be able to deliver this this morning. And I want to read this in the Amplified Bible. And Paul is reminding them there was a time that Elijah thought he was alone. And God had to remind him about the remnant. And Paul says the same thing in his day. There's a remnant. How many know God always has a remnant of those that are faithful? Picking up in verse 3, And Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men that have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant, a small believing minority, 
selected, chosen by grace, by God's unfavored, uh, uh, unmerited favor and graciousness. This is an age of God concentrating on the remnant like never before. And I think as, as a ministry, I have decided, you know, we, we always tried to figure out just kind of what groove we fell into. Because the way I preach, I tend to run off more than I attract. <laughs> we've had two, three, four, I've lost count of how many we've run off because everybody has their own idea of what they want. It's this church model, this program, what, you don't have this program? What, no, no, he's got truth. Excuse me, but truth is its own program. And everybody has their own expectations, but we've never really... It's like tracing back our doctrines. Do they, do they, do they emerge from the enemy's camp? Did our, did our expectations, do they come from Hollywood? <laughs> do they come from Greek theater? Do they come out of mystic, mystic religions? Because when you really start looking at things, guys, <clears throat> very little of it leads back to Jerusalem. Now, one of the things that we need to realize is that much of our expectations of the church are derived from the Catholic Church today in the Protestant movement. Just one I want to show you, and I'm going to try to get everything set up next week because I've got a lot of, of graphics to show you, but I want to do it to where it doesn't mess with the video. This is a setup of what we would call almost modern church. Now, it's a little bit different, but this is actually the way that the Roman court, where you would have the emperor sitting here, and everybody stood out to listen to his decrees, after they began building churches, this became the bishop's throne. And everything else kind of goes out from it. Then he'd have, sometimes he'd have a pulpit. In fact, what's amazing to me, when this thing originally started, the bishop sat on his throne, everybody else had to stand up and listen to him preach. Somehow it's got turned around. But they modeled the church, or the way that the church congregational building is set up, based upon the Roman court. In fact, I've got, I've got friends that, uh, you know, in, in the Pentecostal movement, whether it's white Pentecostal, black Pentecostal, and they've kind of got liturgical with, the, with their uh, setting up bishops. And that ceremony is called the enthronement. Because it goes all the way back to Rome. I remember as, as, a, as a Baptist boy, and this goes all the way back to the Missionary Baptist Church that we were going to uh, back in St. Louis, and, and I had surrendered to ministry and I was singing in the choir, and there was always two or three chairs they'll have special up front for the preachers to sit in. If you go back and think on those, those were little thrones. They were special chairs with a, with a higher back that had the, they were thrones that was even in the Baptist church. Uh, guys, the only throne that's supposed to be here is one for Jesus, and we create it with our praise. And we need, we need to look at the expectations of what we have with the church. Is it, is it drawn from how much, how much of the church right now is theater, Greek theater? They're putting on a show. They're wanting to create an experience for the people that come rather than for God. When you, when you look at everything in the, uh, in the tabernacle, it was all about God. It wasn't about the worshipers. It was to whom they were worshiping, and you had the privilege of coming in and worshiping the true God of the universe. And yet now is everything about us. That's Greek theater. Or is it that we're, our men are setting up their own rule? And if we don't have either one of those, we simply just have programs. Guys, we need to look at several things. Now, one of them I want to look at because there's a difference between being the remnant and going to church. The Roman Catholic system was an organizational-centric system. It made everyone dependent upon the church. In fact, your salvation was dependent upon the church. If they excommunicated you, you got this little badge that says, do not go, do not, you know, go to go, do not collect $200, you go straight to hell. 
that if they kicked you out of the church, it was a sentence to hell. How many know that's pretty church-centric? <laughs> and so everything that they did, you couldn't, you, you couldn't even have this. Only the preacher was allowed to have this. And so you were dependent upon him knowing what God was saying and him to explain to you what God said. And when the Protestant movement began to go forward, men were killed for having Scripture themselves. Men were burned at the stake. Wycliffe, one of the first ones who translated the, the Bible from, from Greek and, and Hebrew and Latin into English, he ended up getting refuge in, in Germany, same place Martin Luther did. <clears throat> it's easy how, interesting how God set things up because the, the king of Austria or Germany wanted to be the next pope and they selected somebody else and so he became a Protestant. <laughs> And it became a haven for these guys to be protected. Well, Wycliffe died of natural causes. When the Catholic Church got to his bones, they dug up his bones, tried him as a heretic because he wrote the word of God in everybody's common language, and then burned his bones. That shows you the hatred. Because it was a system that everything is about the church. And, they, and it was a combination of being church dependent, and they amalgamated some aspects of the true faith with the mystery religions of Babylon that still permeate a lot of everything that we do. My job with biblical life is not to make you dependent upon biblical life. It's to be dependent upon Jesus. To walk with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Whether this ministry continues or not should not affect you except it being a source of you learning more of how to walk with God. But it's our individual walk. Yet we see in societies, I remember when I was stationed in the military in Germany, the, uh, their attitude was, you know, if you, you, you don't learn medicine, so if you, you, you get sick, you go to a doctor. You don't need to learn religion. If you got a question, you go to a preacher. That's kind of been extrapolated over into American society, hasn't it? The average person in the pulpit, we don't have to pray. That's what the preacher's for. We don't have to study. That's what the preacher does. <coughs> We don't walk with God. He walks with God. We just kind of tag on behind. That's not the way of the kingdom. It's a personal salvation. I've got to personally go to the cross. I've got to personally accept Jesus Christ as my Messiah. I've got to personally make sure that that blood covers every area of my life. And then I've got to personally go to the Word and find out how to walk with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I've got to open this book myself and see, when you start learning, when you start getting into the Word of God and start learning yourself, you make my job both easier and harder. Come on now. Easier in that I don't have to spend 16 weeks explaining to you a basic premise that everybody should know, and I can take you on into deeper things. And let me tell you guys, in the, in the coming weeks, we're getting ready to get deep. We have not gotten deep before. I'm getting, we're, we're leaving the kiddie pool. We're leaving the three-foot pool. I'm going to go on into the ocean of God's Word because there's so much there. At the same time, it makes it harder and that I can't get by with anything. If you know the Word, and, and I, I've taught you how to use Strong's Concordance, and I've taught you how to look up the Greek and the Hebrew, and, and, how to, and basic, basic hermeneutics, because you know that, I can't do, grandma taught it, we all bought it, and this really preaches good. <laughs> I can't do that, thank God. You know, it used to be in my life, here in the last few years, I spend most of my time screaming at the evening news because that was a lie, that was a lie, that was fluff to avoid the truth. I do that a lot now with Christian television. friend of mine that just passed away this week, Dr. Marianne Brown, great saint of God. <clears throat> she was as, as far as you could get up as a woman in the Southern Baptist Convention, and then she got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Let me know that gives you the left foot of fellowship. And I have never seen a woman as prophetic as she was. And she has served on some of the largest ministries in America. And in the height back in the 70s and 80s, and the power of God was just moving so powerfully. I mean, people were, the, the dead was being raised. All these, she, she saw all these things. And in the midst of one of the greatest services she was ever in, 
God said, you'll live to see the day that the charismatic movement moves in that level of power in occultic power instead of my spirit. She wanted to say, testing, one, two, three, <laughs> am I on the right channel? You know, she lived to see it. There's a lot of what's be called the newfangled stuff moving in the body of Christ and the charismatic movement stuff. It's nothing but mysticism glossed over to be called Christianity. I see a lot of people that claim to be prophetic, and what, what they're doing is they're, they're tipping into the Zohar in, Greek, in, the, in, in uh, Jewish mysticism that, uh, you know, Kabbalah, every occult individual in the world is thoroughly versed in Kabbalah. Because what they did, can, can, I, just, can I just share this? <clears throat> Rabbi Akiba, they go back and, and Kabbalah started with Rabbi Akiba. He's also the one who uh, designated that Simon Bar Kochba was the real Messiah with the destruction of Jerusalem and uh, the total destruction of Jerusalem in 120 AD. He, they, they take Kabbalah back to him because he rejected Messiah. He also saw that those that followed the Messiah that he rejected had the Holy Spirit. And so he reached in and drew from what the rabbis retained while they were in Babylon and created a fake Holy Spirit through magical workings. And that's the entire purpose of Kabbalah. How many know we don't need that? And we, we don't need Kabbalic prophecies in the church because it really sounds spiritual. Here's the greatest prophetic word that you'll ever receive. If you have ever walked with Jesus for real, you better learn to do it now. You better learn to do it now. Because there's a lot of people that have been playing church for a long, long time that are going to split hell wide open. This is no longer playing games. Guys, we're at the last four minutes of the football game. You better play it. You better go back to the fundamentals. And you better start functioning in the kingdom. The new wineskin in the church is the remnant walking with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob alone. Not a system, not religious organization, but we as individuals walking with God. Remember me saying that we're, we're going to get those that just totally walk with God, and then they'll be attracted to one another because of a kindred spirit. Not programs, not, oh, you got this fancy place, all these different things. It's I sense in my spirit, you're walking with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the same way that I'm walking with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And therefore, since we're walking with him together, I have a kindred spirit with you. And it's going to be the same way as Abraham. Let's go to Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. And I've ministered on this before, but I'm trying to build a foundation of where we're getting ready to go. I can't wait to next week. <clears throat> I'm going to teach you some stuff. God, God has been teaching me and do you know where we're headed? Having a thermo, a spiritual thermonuclear reaction within your heart. That was what was going on in the tabernacle during Moses. That pillar of fire that came out of the top, that was a thermonuclear reaction to the presence of God. Well, Mike, are you talking about blowing things up? Yeah, I want to blow the devil out of here. You know, it's interesting to me that when you go back to the development of the atomic, the first atomic bombs, Oppenheimer and some of the others, every major breakthrough in atomic weaponry was done by a Jewish scientist that was a Kohanim. They were Kohen. Their spiritual DNA knew what the fire of God was, and they created the closest thing humanly possible to the fire of God, which is a thermonuclear reaction. And we talk about it as being the fire of the Holy Ghost. Well, let me tell you something. We've not really seen the fire of the Holy Ghost because it, there has to be components put into place for that reaction to take in your heart. 
And God has been dealing with me. Well, guys, when we get this right, there's no seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's spontaneous. There's no say after me, Rondai, Shondai, let's go get a Hyundai. None of that. It's God fills you, God empowers you, and the mantle of Jesus comes upon you because you got everything in place. Oh, I can't wait. Because I know as I do this, God's going to do stuff in me as he does stuff in you. I can't wait. Have you found Genesis 17 yet? And when Abram was 90 years and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And we read that in English and saying, I'm Almighty God. You better straighten up. Fly right, because I'm here now. That's not what it says in the Hebrew. First of all, Almighty God is El Shaddai. I am the all-sufficient one. I am everything that you will ever need. And son, I'm calling you to walk with me because I want you to panim tamim. Panim, I want you to walk before my face. Come here, boy. I want you to walk with me. And as I do, tamim can be translated perfect, but it's not the perfection like we think of. It's so much more. It means come walk with me and I'll make you complete. Come walk with me and I'll make you sound. Come walk with me and I'll make you helpful. I'll make you whole. I'll make you moral as you walk with me. It's in the halakha. It's in that walking with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he makes us into something that we cannot be made unless we walk with him. That's why walking with an organization will kill you. It is walking with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as an individual responsibility. And as we do that, that, that is what is going to be the earmark of the remnant is they're walking with God and they're not, they're not, well, I've been in the way for 40 years. Yeah, you have been literally in the way. And you've not changed a bit. If you're walking with God, you'll change. Those of you who have been around here for a while, how many know that you guys have been doing some changing? It's not overnight. It's gradual. It's line upon line. It's precept upon precept. You look back and say, I'm different than I was a couple of years ago. That's the way it's supposed to be. I'm tired of hearing the testimonies of, well, I, I accept the Lord 1942, and it was good enough then, and it's good enough now, and I'm the same as I was the day I got saved. God help you. Because that means you sat down and didn't walk. I want to grow up in the Lord. That's one of the reasons why in the body of Christ, the biggest department of all is the nursery. The spiritual nursery. Not the one back off where they're changing physical diapers, but most pastors spend their time dealing with spiritual diapers that 90% of the problems that we have in our lives is because we do not do the word. We have not grown up spiritually. We have not crucified the flesh. We're not walking with God and the whole mess that it creates, we expect the pastor to clean it up. Did you know that when you really start walking with God, 90% of your problems Stop, because you quit creating them. It's not the devil. The devil's got you on automatic. He can go back and have his ham sandwich and drink his beer, and he doesn't have to worry a bit about you because you're going to walk into your own destruction. All he has to do is let you keep the path you're on. But where he really gets worried is when you buddy up to God and say, wherever he goes, that's where I'm going. And I'm going to quit listening to you, and I'm going to start listening to him because he's got some stuff to say. I found out there are commandments. That's God's talk. That's God talking. Commandments are God talking. Son, this is how you function in my kingdom. We have somehow or another... We have equated spirituality 
with a person's ability to adapt to a religious culture. Whether it's Baptist, you get in Pentecostal churches, I want you to be spiritual. Wasn't, wasn't he moved to God? No, not necessarily. It's, I've learned to move. Our Jewish, look, boy, did you see the ZC that guy was toting? He must be really walking with God. He got the extra thick ones. He knows how to sound the shofar. He's, he's got the biggest keeper I've ever seen. It goes all the way down to here. Or maybe even a servant's cap. We, we adapt to a culture, which is the easy part. I mean, it would be real easy for me to, to parade a Torah scroll or to wear a tzitzi while I'm preaching. All those things are easy. The hard part's walking with God when you're not putting on a show. You see, you can have Greek theater in the synagogue. It's walking with God. Now, if we do those things, because we're walking with God, they're fine, they're appropriate. But all it is is show we've got a problem. Isn't that what Jesus said? Don't do as the Pharisees do. They pray in the streets and they do all these things. They've got their reward. Do you know a lot of those guys would actually close their eyes as they walk through the streets unless they see a woman who wasn't properly dressed? How many know that you find stone walls very quickly that way? You might need to see somebody you need to pray for. We can get goofy about these things. One of the things that are going to be emphasized in the days to come, it is not church affiliation. It is being the remnant, and it is walking with God. And there will be an emphasis on my personal walk with God to include my daily spiritual disciplines. There are things, guys, I can't do for you. you got to do yourself. Do you know that I should never, if, if I have a prophetic word, it should never be new news to you. It should be a confirmation of what God's already dealing with you about. Because you're supposed to be able to hear his voice. But as you're, you're learning to hear his voice, you're unsure. It's like, boy, this, God, I, I just don't know. And I believe I'm hearing you, and I, and I, I want to be faithful, but I just need a little help because I'm still learning how to hear. That's when a prophet comes along with somebody prophetic, and they confirm what God's been telling you. I get real happy when I start preaching things and I start hearing across the country other guys are preaching the same stuff. That we're all tied into the same station. Glory to God. There is a spiritual counter going on to the civil rights movement in America. I mean, even the civil rights movement has been hijacked. I don't care what the color of your skin is. You're made in the image of God. And you were given unalienable rights by him. But what, what, and so that's kind of been hijacked over the, over the years. And when I was, when I was at Tabernacles, we, wonderful uh, uh, Brother Bell and his wife, this is the sweetest disposition. They were talking about things going on in the black community. And it rose up in my spirit, we need to quit talking about civil rights and it's time to start moving in kingdom rights. Because kingdom rights are not enforced by the federal government. They're enforced by the kingdom of God. And we, well, there has to be an emphasis on kingdom responsibilities, kingdom rights, and kingdom authority. And it has to go in that area. When I yield to my responsibilities in the kingdom, I can start moving in my rights in the kingdom, and I can exercise kingdom authority. <coughs> I don't want to be like the seven sons of Sceva when I've got to do spiritual warfare. They had better know me because that's a guy who moves in the kingdom. And this is the one that we're going to begin launching onto in the days ahead. We're actively engaged in our priesthood to God. Now, I've taught an entire course called Priesthood of the Believer. That was from the standpoint of the Levitical priesthood. We're getting ready to go into the Kohanim. Because in the book of Hebrews, especially when you read it in the complete Jewish Bible, there was, a, there was a change in the priesthood. Rabbi Stern translated it properly, that you are now God's Kohanim. 
that there, there, is, there are spiritual things to our priesthood that we have got to do that we have never been trained to do. And we say, well, it's because I don't have a temple. Doesn't that make sense? Because I don't have a temple, I can't do it. Guess what? Turn to your neighbor and say, yes, you do. And the response across the congregation was, what? Let me show you something. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. And I'm going to end with this. I'm, I'm trying to build a platform. Now, there, there have been many, many wonderful works done on seeing Jesus and in, in, in the, the, the Mishkan of Moses. And how many know that every bracket, every screw, every nut in that thing is about Jesus? Every curtain, every drapery is about Jesus. Every part of that is about Jesus. But we also find the Apostle Paul says that I'm in him and he's in me. Okay? Now listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 and 17. What? Know ye not that you are the temple of God? You got a temple. Right here. You are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Where was the Spirit of God at? In the temple, in the Holy of Holies. But have you ever examined yourself in light of what I call the universal template? And that's the layout of the tabernacle, the Mishkan of Moses. I don't even, I don't even like to go back to Solomon because the Masons have messed with it too much. And there's probably even some stuff that Solomon put in there he really shouldn't have put in there. But with Moses, he made it exactly like what he saw above. First of all, it was mobile, and it was covered in skin. <laughs> Big tent! <laughs> we are the temple of God. But why we're not walking in the victory that we're supposed to have and why we don't have the power of God of what we're supposed to have, we've never put the furniture in its place and we've never put it together, nor are we functioning as a priesthood in that temple. And here's a revelation for you. Mary, I can't function in your temple, only you can. I'm the priest of my temple. And what happens in this temple, if I don't do it, it doesn't get done. Does that make sense? And you've got to start in the outer court and you've got to move into the inner court and you've got to go into the Holy of Holies and what you do builds the pieces. And you can't have the fire of God until you have the throne of God. But it's a journey to get there. Oh! And we're going to discover in the next couple of weeks what every piece of the furniture is and how to utilize it properly in our lives and how it equates to the cross. Now, I'm going to share this as I end. How many know in the outer court the very first thing was the brazen altar? Well, that's a sacrifice of praise. No, it's not. It's the cross of Christ. You're supposed to be crucified with Christ. There are things you're supposed to crucify in your life. And as I was praying this week, I saw a brazen altar with no fire in it that was covered in cobwebs and dust. And God said, that's the state of the brazen altar in the body of Christ today. They have used grace as a reason never to use the altar. God help us. We can't even get to the good stuff because we can't get past that altar. Because there's a lot of stuff that you've got to put as a sacrifice to the Lord. You've got to crucify it. And what's interesting is everything that you put on there is a burnt offering. The only time you're free of it is when it's been reduced to ash. You know what we do? The minute it begins to squeal, we pull it back off, put it out. I'm sorry. I didn't know it was going to hurt. We 
My job as a, high, as a priest is what I put there. I kill. I mean, no crucifying something is killing it. But when we look at the tabernacle, it's not just killing it. It's, used, it's keeping it there until there's nothing left of it but ash. Why? Because ash is what it originated from. It came from hell. God will never require you to put anything on that altar that does not need to be sacrificed. That didn't originate to hell. And what you see after the fire of God consumes it is its basic element of what it was, ash from hell. We can't even get the body of Christ there. But, I mean, it's, you know what we do? We have left that altar, just sitting alone, and we parade around, we do our programs, we do all this, and everybody just sees about how everybody, because I mean, how many know that outer court's a big place? And so you can dance around, you can do cartwheels, you can, you can, you can, you can bring down a disco ball, whatever you want to do, and call it church, but you've never done what is supposed to be done in that area. That whole area is, get caught. why? Because there's plenty of things that we need to bring in to be burnt offerings. And once you get that down, then it begins to get restrictive because it becomes a kingdom path. I have realized, guys, now I have been preaching since I was 13 years old, and I have yet to really enter into my priesthood. I'm doing really good as a Levite teaching, let there be wisdom in my mouth and, and trying, striving to do that. But as far as my personal priesthood to God, I've not got any of it put together. I've never been taught to. Never even dreamed it possible. And what God is saying for the remnant is they're going to take their priesthood seriously. Put some effort into it. Remember me saying that in, in, in the day that we're getting ready to come into, that what you feed will grow and what you, what you starve will die? In an in a, in accelerated way, in a supernatural way. That's part of the, what we're getting ready to go into. And how many know we need that? We need some stuff to grow in us as individuals. We need some stuff to die. We've tried it before and we've been frustrated that sometimes the stuff that should have died grew and the stuff that should wanted to grow <laughs> kind of looks like me when I, I remember years ago I tried to raise corn. I find out where they get the baby corn from is when guys like me try to grow corn. <laughs> at the end of summer, it's as big as your thumb. And we look at our crop and wasn't this supposed to be corn? It looks more like wheat, you know. It's because Satan has done some things and, and has frustrated us. Now God is saying, listen, if you'll, if you'll yield to me, and learn, I'll show you how to turn the tables on the devil instead of the devil turning the tables on you. And what you seek to kill in your life is going to die. And God's going to add supernatural ability to get it done. And what God needs to grow is going to begin growing if I take my priesthood seriously. This is a clarion call of God to begin learning to move in our priesthood, not as just as a Levite teaching the word. And if you don't know the priesthood, how many know there was a division? There, there were the sons of Aaron, and then there were the sons, uh, the sons of Levi. Levi taught the word, but they never went into the temple. That was reserved for the sons of Aaron. And what the book of Hebrews tells us is that under the order of Melchizedek, we have all been made kohanim. And we have never utilized one ounce of that calling. And so I, over the next couple of weeks, I just want you guys to fast, to pray. Continue fasting one, one day a week or whatever God gives you. You know, some of you may fast coffee or candy or whatever it needs to be. God will show you. But the thing is, Lord, give me that fresh wineskin and then teach me how to build the tabernacle within to honor you. Because I need the fire of God right here flowing in me. Father, I just thank you for your word this morning. Father, I thank you that your word will not return to you void, but will accomplish whereunto you have sent it. And Father, I'm not preaching to the crowd. I'm preaching to the remnant. 
And Father, whether it's on video, on YouTube, Father, however you get it into their hands, Father, I ask that you would supernaturally begin to get these things into the hands of the remnant to prepare them to be that bride without spot nor wrinkle or any such thing. Father, our greatest desire is to reach the point in the book of Revelations where the, she is no longer called the bride, but it says that the wife, his wife has made herself ready. Father, that's our greatest desire is to reach that point. And Father, we look for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to convict, to empower and to make known to us your will in a new and a fresh way. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name.